so the hottest question is, apart from working on relevant projects in machine learning and academia, what other skills or certifications are important to be successful in job applications and interviews? So what can you do while you're still at CERN to make yourself attractive, other than obviously developing machine learning schools um, skills? Diana, do you want to ask, answer our question? Yes. Um, for machine learning, there's a great platform called Kaggle where projects are posted and then you can pursue and then you can advance in the leaderboard using your creativity, using your knowledge. So that is something that employers uh, like. Another thing that employers like to see is a, like uh, open source contributions perhaps in, in uh, active, uh, relevant machine learning uh, repositories, always something to, to pursue as well. All right, great. So not just working on your projects in academia, but participating in Kaggle and, and seeing results on GitHub. Great. Um, Martin? Um, to the same question, um, yeah. Um, I mean, I fully agree with what Diana has said. And I would even say, I mean, in general, any kind of private projects might be of interest. But I mean, it's, of course, more useful if then you have something also to show from it. I mean, I've had, for example, people who were building their own small products that you could access via the via browser, via the web, right, via web API. They were just doing that in private, even perhaps earning a bit of money, maybe spending more money than they were earning. I don't know, but it's definitely something where, which require a lot of experience and which they can show you immediately on the phone or on the screen there, show what they have done. So that also shows experience, which otherwise you perhaps could only get from actually being in a job already. Great. Um, Mirza? I mean, I totally agree with uh, Martin and Diana. Maybe I will also emphasize the importance of soft skills, not only hard skills. So I think it's also very nice to have some experience with, I don't know, organizing events, whatever, where you can prove that you're improving your communications, teamwork, and uh, leadership. This is also very important for the employers, I, I think. Mm -hmm. Jessica, any comments to add? Yeah, um, I guess along the line of soft skills, like, I mean, you probably already have like a lot of relevant skills. Like, it's also about like how you reframe what you've got already. Um, so, for example, like from academia, you'll have loads of communication skills, which is actually really important in machine learning because you need to be able to like com communicate like complex technical things to not just other machine learning people, but like the product team or the customer who don't know anything about machine learning. So highlighting like talks you've done, uh, papers, teaching, stuff like that is also really important. Great. Anthony? Yeah, I would resonate. Uh, what Jessica said resonates with me a lot. I think the... Um... The soft skills are important. I think CERN prepares you very well for working with others. I think that's a skill that maybe gets undervalued. You wouldn't get that in cargo necessarily. Uh, but outside of that, I would say try to, then again, it's something that Jessica touched on, but try to dig into the questions of why your work matters, right? I think being able to confidently talk about why the things you did can be interesting um, or have been interesting to to anyone. I think that's it's a quite important skill. I think during interviews, a lot of people fail. A lot of people have done very wonderful work, very interesting things. They've worked on hard problems and they struggle to communicate them. And often it's because they um, they haven't thought much about the, the meaning behind these things. And there's nothing like uh, as an interviewer getting on a call with somebody that's just enthusiastic about what they worked on. And sometimes it's a skill. Um, so it's good to practice, I think. If I could just follow up on that, are you saying that it's crucial to have the ability in general to talk about why your work is important, as ev your evidence, your ability to like communicate and participate in discussions and be persuasive, or is it just crucial that you communicate the importance of the actual work that you have done uh, in your previous um, <clears throat> previous efforts? So I think so. In my organization, for instance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address the third question, but in my organization, one of the toughest ch challenges we have is figuring out how to work on the right thing. Mm -hmm. And often that boils down to being able, you know, making the right decision be, uh, boils down to being able to dis decide, you know, discuss the trade-offs between different things we can work on and decide the thing that we think has the highest impact. And I think to get to that point where you can do that efficiently, it helps to retroactively look through the work that you've done and ask yourself, why is this meaningful? Who, who might care about this piece of work? Um, so I don't know if, if I address uh, yeah. that point. Yeah. 
you know, science is about people and so is industry. And so you have to learn how to talk to people and think think the way people think. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. All right. Um, our next question is actually the opposite. The, this previous question was, what skills other than machine learning? This question is more drilling into how much how much hands-on machine learning is actually required to be competitive for these kind of jobs. Is a significant amount of actual I worked on machine learning experience required or the general person from particle physics who knows statistics and has done about a bunch of research um, sufficient to be an attractive candidate? Let's go back and start with uh, Gianna. Um, um, yes, I think uh, we are in a world where there is a spectrum or like a multitude of different roles that surrounds machine learning where different people can come and contribute with different angles and then transition uh, uh, from one to another. So for example, uh, for a machine learning experience to happen, there needs uh, some data scientists making insights based on a product. There might need some data engineers that's going to collect the data and get this data ready for machine learning training and inference. Uh, there is also like the opportunity of working within research in the industry. So there's machine learning tech researchers, for example, at Spotify, my previous employer, the, uh, the tech research organization was also very strong and there would be collaboration between engineers and researchers so i would um, i would offer that there is multiple paths within machine learning there's uh, data science for insights and analytics there is uh, engineering for putting end-to-end -end machine learning uh, products in production um, and also research so trying to enter through one perspective will allow you to also go to others i myself um, from academia to doing research on neural networks, I went to more building my software engineering skills. And then I found myself later on when machine learning became a thing and there was a role called machine learning engineer, that that is where my angle was. And then I, I was invited to, to, to join that role. So that's one perspective. Great, thank you. Martin, how crucial is it that people have specific machine learning experience or general research skills from having uh, sufficient? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends a lot on the kind of role that you apply to, for sure. If it's a very junior role, then uh, you can get away with having not a lot of experience or even no experience, as long as you can plausibly convince your opposites that you have the potential to do that, right? As soon as the role becomes a bit more senior, I think experience is really what matters most. Even, I mean, from the side of the employer, if you have to choose between someone who has already proven that they have the skills and someone where you have to evaluate whether they have the potential to develop the skills, you will always go for the person who has the skills if you know everything else is equal. So I think there are a lot of roles and I mean, I think it's fine to start with some junior roles, even if you're not super young anymore when dealing with a PhD or a postdoc, always having maybe the next or next to next job in view where you can then use the experience that you have gained. Um, and of course there's always, and still there's a large demand for machine learning experts. So companies might look for people which have experience, but simply not find any or not find enough and in that case, I mean, if the only choice is people who do not have a lot of experience, then yeah, again, by convincing them of your potential, it might be sufficient, but yeah, it's very hard to beat having the actual experience. I think if you're competing with other people, but there still is a huge demand, even, I mean, you're all hearing about these layoffs in the tech sector, but I think still it's mostly the US that are affected, not so much the rest of the world. And even, I mean, in the US, these kind of cycles are quite normal. They fire, they hire again. So I think there's still a huge demand and the market is still in a very good place for people looking for jobs as compared to the other side, right? There's more people needed than there actually are. That's great to hear. Um, Miroslav, what are your thoughts on the question? 
I mean, especially for the entry level jobs, I think it's much more important to have like a broad technical knowledge of computer science, statistics, and so. And so uh, I think that you will learn all the required specifics during your job, actually. And also, I think that every company has its specifics in the technologies, in the working processes. So even if you get a very nice expertise in something and you find a job for that expertise, I am convinced that you will have to learn a lot of things uh, when you when you arrive to the company. Makes sense. Great. Uh, Jessica? Yeah, I think I'd agree with what everyone else has said. I mean, my experience is that, yeah, I literally had my three months internship and that was all of my machine learning experience before I got a job. Um, so, yeah, I think internships are a really valuable way to get some specific experience if you want it um, and you're able to. Um, but also, like, I also did some, like, reading around in my spare time. Um, I think it's good to try and get, like, a broad understanding of like a range of models. So even if you don't have specific experience, like having an understanding of ML is also very useful. Great. And then Anthony? I think it, it really matters. Uh, you know, the context matters. And, and it's something that's, that other people raised already. But depending on, depends on the jobs that you're looking at. Some companies would look for a broad experience. Some companies would look for a very narrow experience. At some level, to me, it boils down to what's interesting for you. So if you've had some experiences um, and certain things that you're interested in, naturally you'll find it easier to find jobs in these kinds of organizations. So the problem then becomes, can, you, can I find the right organizations that would reward and appreciate my skill set? And similarly, if there's an organization or a project or a domain that you're very interested in, but you haven't had a lot of practice, maybe trying to practice and understand, you know, building an appreciation for what this organization does and needs can be helpful. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Um, I think people in the audience would now like to hear a little bit more about your personal life, specifically about your work-life balance. Uh, we've all heard about difficulties of work-life balance in academia. What's it like out there in industry? You put your job down at 5 p.m. and not answer work emails? Or is there the same sort of overriding responsibility to get your work done no matter when you have to work? Uh, let's start with Deanna. Uh, yes, um, when it comes to this question, I think at the time that I was at academia, I was much younger and I had so much energy and I would spend late hours in the laboratory and I don't do that with 35 years old anymore. I think it's a good thing. Um, I did work in like uh, here in Sweden in two companies, Spotify, and now I'm working at the QT. Spotify is a very fresh, young company with a lot going on, a lot of events that you are not there working, but you're still socializing and connecting with colleagues, almost like on a daily basis, you have an after work. Um, so that can be intense, but it's not, there's no pressure for you to, to engage with that. So it's about you and your energy, uh, whether you join those things. Um, Currently working in the financial industry, which is typically uh, deemed as a high intensity industry of working late hours. I am lucky to be in a Swedish company with a Swedish culture where, for example, like, um, like parental leave is uh, very well supported and working at, uh, life balance is also uh, very well supported. So to answer it, um, it is possible to have a great work-life balance. I'm, I'm here talking to you in the middle of my workday. It was highly supported by my manager. On a typical day at 5 p.m., I'm pretty much done. And I have a work phone and a personal phone. And those are two different things that I highly recommend people to think about separating uh, moving forward. So uh, it's also about your intention and how much you want to separate. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Martin, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I mean, the short answer, it's a lot better than in academia, for sure, in general and in average and everywhere. The slightly longer answer, of course, it will depend a bit on, on countries and cultures and laws and so on. But there are probably some counterexamples to that as well. Definitely, I think in most European countries and uh, where the experience in Austria, I mean, you, you have your fixed working hours and that's it you don't work extra overtime 
normally and definitely not unpaid overtime. That would be yeah, unlawful and companies don't encourage or don't would not accept that. But yeah, even like, I mean, as we have these cliches, at least in Austria and Europe about the US, for example, people working a lot of hours, a lot of pressure on people. But last week I was uh, at Microsoft for an event. We were invited from the company. And at 4 p.m., essentially, the buildings were empty. And I started wondering, I asked my hosts, where are all the people? And I said, well, it's 4 p.m. A lot of people start at 8, so they go home at 4 p.m. So even, yeah, in the U.S. at Microsoft, it seems like very good work-life balance. And I would say in most places in the world is most certainly not in all places, but yeah, definitely better than in, in academia. <laughs> It sounds wonderful. Let's see how representative it is. Uh, Miroslav, what's your experience? My work-life balance in academia was okay, and my work-life balance here is okay as well, so <laughs> I'm happy. Uh, however, I mean, it, it depends on the countries, it depends on the companies, especially, for example, in the consulting companies, working hours may be a little bit late compared to technology companies. Uh, however, I think it's a very legit question for the interview to ask if you're supposed to work overtime, ask about the work-life balance of, of the employees. Just just ask during the interview or you can do a research on Glassdoor. It depends on, on the country and company. Okay, Jessica? Yeah, I mean, work-life balance was one of the reasons I left academia. Like, you know, when I was an academic, you know, collaborating with people in the US, like you'd have to have meetings at like 7, 8 p.m., which is just not fun. Um, I also feel like when I was in academia, I felt um, a lot of like pressure to publish. So like I felt guilty about taking time off, like taking holidays, whereas now like I have loads of holiday time and I have people telling me, make sure you take your holiday and make sure you look after yourself. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I take care of my well-being a lot more now. Great. Anthony? I think it depends on, as always, the, the circumstances under which you're in, uh, the circumstances in which you're in. Uh, in my previous company, for instance, I was working with stakeholders in the US, I'm based in the UK, and also in East, uh, in East Asia. So what that meant is that uh, my US colleagues would pressure me to kind of stay late. My East, uh, East Asian uh, colleagues would pressure me to get up early in the morning, and that was very difficult. Obviously, there was there was more flexibility, uh, the exchange of that, but now now at Skyscanner, I have, I, I, I'd say I have very good work-life balance. Having said that, I do work in, in the domain of operations. And if you're on call in that kind of scenario, you might uh, you might be woken up in the middle of the night. But it really depends on, on your circumstances. And I think uh, Miroslav had a very good point, or, or, uh, or even Martin actually, um, ask, ask during interview and try to understand this. Uh, each company will be different. Great to hear about the uh, sort of range of experiences there. Um, the next burning question from folks is how competitive the industry is now for hiring. As, as we heard, I think it was um, Martin mentioned, there are some layoffs. Uh, which specific jobs have become more competitive and less competitive in recent years uh, that folks in academia, especially at CERN, might be interested in? Yeah. Let's start with that, Gianna. Yes, uh, I think it's it's true. We need to be uh, mindful that there has been layoffs. Uh, folks that are very talented are in like uh, easily accessible talent pools that might be uh, competing to your skills. Um, I think it's almost like seasons in in a year. There's winter, there's spring, there's summer. It's a cycle. Uh, this is going to become a different season uh, anytime soon. Um, but it's uh, about understanding your strategy when it comes to facing this kind of winter, spring, where there's layoffs and the, the market is very heated. Um, what I have seen, for example, 50 years ago, when the, the, the boom was about big data, uh, everyone was talking about big data, but Brazil back then, was uh, having a bit of a crisis and the, the job market was tricky. And the big data related departments were, you know, they took a while to prove their value. So they were the first ones to be slashed. So when you look at the current situation in machine learning uh, uh, within this market is 
uh, if if the companies like are investing in machine learning, typically these investments requires you know data engineers and uh, further research and 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 like longer time span to, from idea to value, for example. So this this departments have been I, I've observed that they have been uh, um, slashed with some layoffs, unfortunately. Uh, so there's uh, yeah needs to be mindful about the competition right now. Um, great startups are becoming uh, are coming to life. AQT is an investor that invests both on like uh, venture capital growth and bigger buyouts. And I see that the the um, there are so many great startups coming to life when it comes to using machine learning and AI. And that's a great uh, angle for you to uh, navigate in this uh, layoff scenario. Great. And then Martin, your thoughts on which jobs are more or less competitive given the recent spate of layoffs? Mm. I mean, as I was saying before, I think the layoffs really mostly affected the US, not so much the rest of the world, not so much Europe for sure. So I think there's still a very high demand in particular for good people. I wouldn't worry about that too much. And I'm also sure, I mean, the US follows this cycle more closely. European companies rather, you know, keep people for a couple of months if they already see that it will be going up again. In the US, it's a bit different. Also, salaries were quite a bit overheated there. So maybe this also kind of served to dampen the salaries a bit. But I wouldn't be too worried in midterm or long term. Um, machine learning, I think, is here to stay and people are needed to do that. I don't think ChatGPT will be taking more jobs over anytime soon. Yeah, about the roles, I mean, I think the field is, of course, changing so quickly. So you need to have a some very basic skills that you that are applicable in many different ways, which are not very, very specific to a certain, I don't know, software or architecture model or whatever. And of course, you have to keep learning. And what's definitely helpful is if you have some solid software engineering background as well. I mean, if you know how to program, how to do the whole DevOps stuff, deployments, if you have some knowledge into that area, I think that's definitely very valuable. Great. Miroslav? I mean, I completely agree with Martin. I wouldn't be way too concerned about the layoffs. From my personal experience, like three years ago at IBM, we were hiring anyone with a basic knowledge of machine learning and data science. And of course, now, because the big companies hired people, they shouldn't have hired. There are some layoffs. But uh, I mean, there's a seasonality of the market. Uh, I wouldn't be way too concerned about this. Yeah, I, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't comment on, on the future. But I can say several things. So the first one, the, the more prepared you are, the better able you'll be to adapt to whatever changes happen. Sometimes I think people that get affected by layoffs are not necessarily the ones that are the weakest. It can happen, you know, kind of at a spreadsheet level. Uh, but what that means is that the more prepared you are, the better you'll be able to adjust to this. In my, in my company personally, we, we've tried to slow down hiring a little bit, but also the leadership also is realizing that there's this opportunity ahead. And so they, they, they may be going to start reopening things soon, but, um, it also depends on, you know, um, if you do something very specific and a company needs something very specific and you offer that, you'll be at the top of this. So there's a, there's a bit of luck there. And I think that demand is not uniform across the industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, our next question is about how to prepare for the transition. Um, there are people who are wondering if they should be doing specific online courses or certifications to make sure that they seem appealing. For example, some standard tools like PyStar, Databricks, Tableau, cloud computing, et cetera, things. Some people are worried that there may be filters that prevent them from even being examined if they don't have any specific experience. Is it worth people's time to get to do short online courses so they can list these things on their CV? Uh, let's start with Diana. Great. Um... My, my experience with hiring has been mostly for more senior roles. And when it comes to more senior roles, um, it's almost like there's different school of life, just like, you know, martial arts, there's karate, there's jujitsu, and you, you want to get a candidate that kind of has the same school of thoughts of the company and that 
mm-hmm. can resemble in the tech stack, like it, whether it's Google Cloud Platform or AWS or Azure, um, and all of those things come together. But when it comes to like uh, um, entry level roles, I think uh, it, most uh, hiring managers uh, are looking for the potential and like the the critical thinking of the person. And by doing courses such as like uh, Coursera on let's say PySpark or Databricks and comparing and being able to talk about what did you like about Tableau versus Power BI and how, what would you choose for a given circumstance. This critical thinking is good and you need to get some insight and it's great to learn from um, courses. And of course, uh, when it comes to listing, uh, list all the courses that you've uh, done and, and, and more and talk about interest and you know those natural language processing techniques used by HR tools are gonna be <laughs> better to get them in your favor and not against you. Okay, wonderful. Um, Martin, do you agree? Yeah, I I do agree. I mean, it's definitely good to have some broad knowledge about all these topics. And if you have, then you should also list them. Make sure, I mean, that you really have at least some basic understanding then so that you can at least talk about them in your interview. Otherwise, that would be quite embarrassing if you list them in your skills and you have really no understanding about it. Um, yeah, so I think some of these courses are very nice to get like into a topic and it also does help to kind of survive maybe the first or second round of interviews by doing some courses and adding this to your skill list if you want. I don't think in the end courses will land you any job. No one will hire you because you've done a Coursera job. Okay. Real experience is what matters. If you then apply that knowledge, someone can demonstrate it. Okay, but just because you've taken the course, no. Yeah, to be able to talk about it intelligently, Um, Miroslav. Well, please don't put these skills into your CV if you had just like thirty minutes tutorial on YouTube. Because okay, maybe you will pass the HR screening, but it will be very awkward with the senior developer during the interview. I think that there are many certifications for, especially for cloud companies like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, Databricks, where they offer a well-defined track of knowledge. And you can do a certification like entry-level certification, professional certification, you can look it up on the internet. And uh, from my experience, uh, companies are usually looking at the certification, not just mentioning your skills. And if you mention the skill, they'll ask you, what kind of certification do you have? Because for them, it's a very good benchmark of uh, how how experienced are you with these technologies. So my recommendation would be check the certification, like professional certifications from the cloud providers. Maybe do some tutorials, try some projects using these technologies. And then if you acquire the certification, it's very nice to put this into your CV. Great. Uh, Jessica, what are your thoughts? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I guess um, courses could be like um, useful and like certifications are probably useful. Um, I don't know. I mean, to me, that sounds like a lot of like very specific or like, do you know this specific package or like this specific interface? And like, you might know something similar. So like, you might not know one cloud computing platform, but you know a different one. So like, I think more general skills are more important. Like, do I know cloud computing rather than do I know this specific one? Because you want to be applicable to lots of companies and they'll all use different things. Great. Anthony, what are you thinking about this specific I think course? Jessica put it quite quite well in the sense that you want to be looking at the core foundational transferable skills and then uh, uh, you know, being able to talk about specific instances or emphasizing the things you know is quite helpful. Um, in terms of particular technologies, I would say cloud computing is definitely the one core skill that you have to get hands-on experience to the level that you can talk about it confidently. That usually means in building some involved project. I think you're not gonna get there with just a simple, uh, a simple tutorial that you follow. But beyond that, also consider that there will be companies that use these HR software, the screens, and literally looks for particular technologies. And if you don't happen to have these technologies, as Miroslav was saying, you're gonna have an awkward conversation. And to my mind, that means these are just companies that are not fit for you because when you're applying for a job, the company is trying to find whether you're a good fit for them. But you should also 
evaluate companies and make sure that they are a good fit for you. And if they are seeking a technology or a particular piece of knowledge that you don't have and they're not willing to compromise, that's uh, you're better uh, you you're better off spending your time doing something else, not involved uh, being involved with that company. Yeah, you want to make sure you have a job that you can actually do. <laughs> That's important. Wonderful. Um, so the next question before we take our break is about how to stand out. Uh, so the question is that it seems like everyone these days can do data science and machine learning. How can people stand out? Um, and it's related to a question also in the, that was asked in the chat, which is whether you actually need like a PhD or a postgrad degree um, in machine learning. So how does one stand out and is it crucial to have a postgrad degree in machine learning? Uh, Gianna? Yes, I, it starts with uh, sharing your journey. So when you mentioned to a prospect employer, I worked at CERN, I did a summer internship at CERN, I've done many engagements with CERN. This is already standing out. So you're already in, in a standout uh, place, everyone in this call. Um, I think it's also uh, worth to 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 like locate yourself, understand your scope in the very complex terrain of machine learning. Are you more interested and passionate about production, end-to-end uh, -end solutions that are reliable and scalable? Are you more interested in like research and like you know, not uh, um, not being too generic about machine learning and thinking of like you know this is where i am passionate about this is where i'm gonna stand out because i'm i'm, I'm dedicated in, into growing in this area that would be my 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 recommendation great uh, martin yeah no, i agree with that and i mean i think the, the one thing to stand out with is of course any kind of experience that you have i mean a lot of people nowadays can do machine learning. It's actually quite simple. If you Google it, you find some Python code, you can run it, you can do a lot of stuff. Everyone can do that. But to really use something in a product is a different thing. So if you already have some experience and that can also be like in a research environment, you just have to frame and phrase it the right way. Then that's definitely one thing that helps. Anything, you know, remarkable in your CV, of course, also helps to stand out, as uh, Jana was saying with the CERN experience, for example. I mean, I have it somewhere written, maybe that sounds ridiculous, uh, that I contributed to the Higgs boson discovery, which is, I mean, it's actually true. And people read it, they remember it. Um, yeah, it, I think it helps put such stuff. I mean, at the very least, people will remember you more easily, I think. And the other thing, I mean, in the end, I think the final interview is is very important the impression that you leave there and then it's not so much the hard skills anymore, but also the soft skills and simply the impression that they get from you. It's important that you are well prepared. It's important that you can present your thoughts in a structured way. It's important that you ask the right and smart questions, all these kind of things. So I think for the final decision, this interview and how you simply perform there, that's really very relevant. Great, thank you, Miroslav. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. Uh, I would just add that you have plenty of CVs like with great technical experience, but sometimes what I miss is uh, like some soft skills, some examples of leadership, and so. So if you want to stand out from the crowd, I think it's nice to to get some experience in organizing events teaching students, uh, participating in hackathons, organizing hackathons, something like that. This is something that could really help you stand out of the crowd and help you in the interviews as well. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, yeah, I agree with what everyone else has said about how to stand out. Um, we had a question about, do you need a postgrad degree to like be an MLE? So like, I do have a PhD. Um, and I think it depends on the role you want to go into. So for example, my role is quite researchy. So they really ex appreciated that I have that research experience and that I know how to do that. But then there'll be other roles which are less researchy where you don't necessarily need it. Um, so for example, at my company, we kind of have two broad categories of people. We have the people who did STEM PhDs and then we have people who did masters in machine learning. So that could also be a way, like rather than doing a PhD, like doing like a one year master's course um, to get some good experience. 
Um, but yeah, I don't think you need it for certain roles. It depends. If I can quickly add to that, it's uh, just a comment. I'm an undergrad dropout and I am a machine learning engineer for almost a decade. So you can, uh, you can be, uh, for example, when it comes to engineering uh, focus, you can be um, even without a PhD. Great, you and Mark Zuckerberg both. Um, then let's hear from Anthony to wrap things up before our break. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I like I like Miroslav's comment that it breaks into two components, right? There's the technical pieces. And if everybody's doing tutorials, you're not going to stand out by doing the exact same tutorials. So maybe try to think orthogonally there. But more importantly, on the soft skills, apart from, you know, being able to communicate about ideas, I think it helps to demonstrate your passion. Uh, technical skills you can teach, but it's very difficult to make somebody excited about something that they don't care about. And from that point of view, I would encourage you to follow the things within machine learning that you find curious and interesting and just go deep, go deep, follow your curiosity and, and that, that will show through. And you might not have done most of the things in the huge landscape, but if you've done a tiny, you know, pinhead sized piece and you've gone super deep, uh, that would show. And that's something onto, you, onto which you can build other skills and, uh, and ideas, but especially for people starting out, enthusiasm and being full of energy and being willing to kind of start learning something that's potentially very large is a big differenti differentiating factor, I think. Great. Thanks very much, everybody on the panel for those thoughts. Uh, we do have more questions that are specifically about how to prepare for the interview and the CV. Um, we're going to take a break now, and when we come back, we're going to address a lot of those questions we ask the panels about how to ace their job interview and their application. Mm -hmm.